we have people that are interested in plants, our California native plants, and I would say that some of us are passionate. Our mission is to enjoy, study, and conserve the plants and the habitats. We do this through education, science, and promote native gardens for those of, the, of you who are interested. If you are new here, please visit our website and sign up to get announcement of our lectures, programs, and field trips. And if you join us as a member, you will also get our newsletter and more goodies. We would like to also acknowledge that we live on a land that was once populated by indigenous people. And we had a wonderful field trip to the mountains at the uh, Devil's Punch Bowl on May 7 with Cliff and Gabby. I want to thank them for organizing it and also thank Mickey Long for joining us with his expertise. The Bobcat Fire in 2020 uh, burnt badly all of the land there, including the nature center, and it just opened the park. So that was a fun trip. Then I will uh, turn it over to Orke Black to present our speaker for tonight. Thank you, Helena. Um, yeah, so we have, we are lucky to have tonight, we have David Bryant, who is the Director of Education for CNPS, our, our statewide organization. And then we may be lucky enough to be graced by both Rose Ramirez and Deborah Small. Um, Rose is of Chumash descent, is a California native basket weaver, photographer, and educator. Deborah Small is an artist, a photographer, and, um, and Professor Emerita at um, Cal State U San Marcos. And um, they have they have both. Um, my screen is freezing up, so they are the author of a wonderful book on, on the ethnobotany of California and Baja. Um, and um, and and started this whole uh, thing off with it with an article in California Native News about sage poaching. So um, without further ado, um, uh, turning it over to you, David. Thank you, Orchid, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. It's it's a real honor, and it feels a little bit like a homecoming because San Gabriel Mountains is my chapter. <laughs> um, I I lived in Claremont for four years. I I worked over at California Botanic Garden, and so uh, the chapter is really special to me, and it's just a real treat to be able to present uh, tonight on this topic. Um, and so, as Orchid mentioned, this this is really a partnership. Uh, Rose Ramirez and Deborah Small are really the leaders of this work, and. Um, we felt at CNPS that it was really important to support uh, the advocacy and work that's going on with uh, Saging the World with White Sage. And so I'm going to share tonight um, <clears throat> uh, some work that we're doing together, the campaign Saging the World, and also the related documentary. I'm going to show a trailer um, and talk a lot tonight about White Sage, Salvia Appiana, um, it is, you know, it's really uh, the San Gabriel Mountains it's that, that's right square in the heart of White Sage territory. Uh, this is a really vital plant in Chaparral and, and uh, coastal sage scrub communities. And it's also deeply, deeply sacred and, and culturally vital to um, indigenous communities in Southern California and Baja. So I'm going to talk all about that tonight and talk about the work that we're collectively um, leading to uh, stop the rampant poaching that we're seeing of white sage, as well as the cultural appropriation that has kind of become international in scope. So um, the first thing I want to do, I'm going to just stop sharing for one second, and I'm going to pull up uh, the trailer for our film. And uh, just a little bit of a preface. Uh, we created a documentary, <laughs> uh, the California Native Plant Society did, with Rose Ramirez and with Deborah Small, uh, co-produced this film. And this film, Saging the World, is the heart of our campaign. And we really think, as I'll talk a little bit later, uh, that education is going to be vital in this work to uh, help people see and know the truth behind sage bundles that are, that are really ubiquitous. So um, let me do that one more time just to make sure that the sound is optimal for everybody. I'm going to click that. Perfect. All right, here it goes. It's about two minutes.
we all recognize it when we see it. Cultural appropriation, I think various cultural traditions are taken. And I think that's the key word, taken. Taken, but there's nothing given back. I ask everybody to learn about the sage and how to use it before thinking that taking a match or a lighter to it is the way to go. Nadie puede usar nuestras ceremonias porque las, nuestras ceremonias son únicas y auténticas y propias. Over the last seven or eight years, I would imagine that there's probably been in excess of 15, 20,000 pounds of white sage taken out of these foothills. It's not just Americans anymore. It's becoming increasingly harvested in large quantities for commerce in other parts of the world. Was it really worth doing something that has a bad effect on other people and other living things just so you can have a smudge stick? When you change the way you think and you see them as relatives, you wouldn't go pull your grandmother out by the roots. You would love her caringly every day. That's when that mind shift changes. All right. Okay, back to our presentation. So yes, we're really excited. We're starting to share this documentary with uh, through many different community screenings um, and soon to be film festivals. And tonight I will talk about that and kind of the larger body of work about uh, staging the world. All right, so I'm just gonna share my screen one more time. Okay, is that popping up for everybody? Look David, there's a black bar um, over this over this sage Let on the right hand okay. side of the screen. Does that kind of make it go away? It's mostly gone. Okay, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, uh, no. Okay, all right. Well, we'll that's all right. Um, all right, and I want to start off by saying that this this body of work and the documentary is dedicated to the late Barbara Drake, a Tom the Elder. I think uh, I feel that many people on this call probably know know her and and. Uh, she had such an impact in our communities, especially around native plants. Uh, she was part of the Chia Cafe Collective um, and really influenced me in, in really profound ways. And so uh, we felt, Rose, Deborah, and I felt that it was really important to uh, dedicate the Saging the World documentary and, and work to her. Okay, so to get into the issue, White Sage, as I mentioned, Salvia Appiana, um, it is a one of our wonderful sage plants. California, I think, has upwards of 20 native salvia or sage species. Um, and white sage is just one of the absolute most beautiful sages that you'll ever encounter. It has an incredible aroma. I think probably many people on this call have experienced it before. Um, and it's, it is really emblematic of our chaparral and coastal sage scrub. And it's important to know, you know, this, this whole body of work really centers and, and amplifies indigenous communities in Southern California and Baja. That's really integral to telling the story of white sage. It's integral to telling the story of native plants. And so I, I bring this map up. This is a really great website to look at, native-land.ca. It will show you um, indigenous communities and kind of the historical and continued uh, territories. Um, not just not just in California, but across the world. But you can zoom into where you live, and you can see where you know what are the indigenous uh, tribal uh, groups, uh, communities that um, have been part of the landscape that you live on for you know countless generations. Um, and I bring I, I focused in here on Southern California. This is in, in Baja. This is the range of white sage um, from about San Luis Obispo in the north down to northern Baja California and poking a little bit into our deserts, but this is really the range of white sage. So you can start to see uh, the indigenous communities that overlap with white sage and have, have been in relationship with white sage for again, thousands of generations. And so as you, as you saw a little bit in the, in the trailer for the documentary, you know, this, uh, a huge core message is that 
White Sage has ancestral genealogical living connections to native communities in Southern California and in Northern Baja. And that's a point that's often very much missed in this viral trend, the cultural appropriation of smudge sticks. And so uh, these uh, slides and imagery were put together by Rose and Deb. I just wanted to give a little bit of a of context. So uh, Norma Mesa, you saw her in the trailer. Uh, she is Kumaye. Uh, she lives near Tecate um, in, in Northern Baja. Um, and she talks here of just about how integral White Sage is. I think one of the most profound things I've, I've heard in this work is that, you know, when uh, she is preparing for ceremony, when her community is preparing for ceremony, uh, they prepare white sage and put the white sage in a dark space and let that sage, uh, let it rest for several days so that it too can prepare for the ceremony. Um, and it's used in, in funerals, it's used in, uh, you know, throughout these really important ceremonial events um, for many other things, for teas and for, for medicine. So it's really just a, a, an inter, a culturally integral plant um, in Norma's community and in, in Norma's life. Uh, Heidi Harper Lucero, she's another person that you saw in the trailer. She's a Hashiman and Mutsun um, And a Hashiman is a kind of Orange County area along the coast um, and, and kind of going out into other parts, San Juan Capistrano. Um, and so Heidi's worked uh, as an archeologist in archeology span work and working with uh, uh, repatriating and rematriating uh, bodies of, of elders um, and that's part of NAGPRA. I think it's the North American Graves Repatri Protection and Repatriation Act. And when she talks about the work to rebury ancestors, there's a, a, an immense amount of protocol and White Sage is part of that protocol almost every step of the way, um, transporting uh, ancestors, uh, reburying them. White Sage is just a really critical part of that. Um, so it's just, it's just such a deeply interwoven part of, of her life. Um, and this is Kimberly Morales Johnson. She's Gabrielino Tongva. That is really right, kind of in the in the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, and she talks about in the film, you know, she and you'll hear this perspective echoed a lot that plants are relatives. And when people like Kimberly go out and see a white sage being poached, see it being commodified, see it being sold, uh, it's like pimping out the blessing. Those are her words. Um, all right, so I've talked a little bit about the, the really deep cultural connection that indigenous communities in uh, Southern California and Northern Baja have with White Sage and continue to have. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the ecological connections. Uh, first, just as a preface, so again, this is the range of, of White Sage. Uh, these are herbarium records, those, these little blue dots. Um, and that uh, gray mass is development. And so you can see there were many, many, many blue dots underneath that development layer. Uh, we've already uh, in California dramatically altered and impacted the landscape that white sage grows in. Um, you know, estimates are about 50, around 50 percent have I've already been just completely developed um, in the range of white sage. So that's kind of the that's kind of the kind of scary preface that we're already dealing with with this species. Um, I want to touch on these ecological connections. So the maps I'm showing you down on the bottom are iNaturalist uh, observations. So um, iNaturalist is a community science app, and you can take photos uh, anywhere of plants, of animals, of other organisms, and you can upload those photos to iNaturalist, and it, it kind of goes into this larger community science understanding of, uh, of our natural world. And so what's really neat about that is you can query, you can look at the range maps of observations for these species. So these are by no means perfect or scientific. You know, each one of these dots is coming from someone's observation. Um, and of course, there's many more people living in, you know, the LA County area than are perhaps out in Central Valley. But nonetheless, it's a really nice tool to look at kind of this, the distribution of species right now. So this is the distribution of the valley carpenter bee. Um, and I'm gonna show you from this slide for another you know, 10 or 15 slides, I'm gonna show you all of these different organisms, you know, just the tip of the iceberg really, that relate to, depend on, connect with white sage. Um, so I'm starting with the valley carpenter bee because it's, it has such a special relationship with white sage. There was a, a study done 
I think in the 60s out of California Botanic Garden, which what is now a, or used to be Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden. And botanists basically went up to the foothills in the San Gabriel Mountain, mountains, and they looked at black sage and they looked at white sage and they just really studiously studied the flowers of both species as pollinators came to pollinate those flowers. And so they like spent an intense time looking at black sage, they spent an intense time looking at white sage. They noticed that there were so many different species of pollinators, uh, butterflies, bees, hummingbirds, um, and other insects that visited black sage. There was a much more finite, narrow number of pollinators that pollinated white sage. And white sage has this amazing kind of like sock-like flower. It's crazy, it looks like this accordion, you know, I'll, I'll show you one a little later. It's a very crazy flower. And in order to successfully pollinate that flower, a pretty chunky bee <laughs> has to sit on that flower in order for it to unfurl and for the bee to, success, to successfully pollinate the flower. Um, European honeybees love white sage, but they're not good pollinators. They, they're not effective pollinators because they don't trip the mechanism of the flower to totally open it up for the exchange of pollen. So these really wonderfully uh, large bees are so important to white sage uh, because they are one of the few like very successful pollinators of the plant. Um, so I want you, as we go through these species, I want you to keep in mind this map. This is the distribution map of white sage um, and then the maps below. And you'll start to see that they, they, they really fit together like puzzle pieces in a lot of ways. These species are interconnected. They, they rely on each other um, in many different ways. And so, you know, it's just, I think these maps are really good cues, really good puzzle pieces to see um, how these species fit together. Uh, this is the foothill carpenter bee, another uh, larger bee species, and that's its range map. This is the yellow-faced bumblebee. And now we're getting to Casas hummingbird. This is a pollinator of hummingbirds can pollinate uh, white sage, um, not as actively as black sage, but they still do. It's still, um, they still do love white sage. And here's, here's evidence, here's Anna's hummingbird um, approaching a white sage plant. And again, like note the range of, of Anna's hummingbird, just how much that overlaps. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the species that, you know, the nectar of white sage is just one way that it, it's providing to this vast web of life. Another one is it's really nutritious seeds. So um, some species that uh, utilize the seeds are the Western harvester ants, uh, kangaroo rat, the lesser goldfinch, and, and this goldfinch is that you can actually see evidence. There's the, there's the seed it's taking from the white sage plant. California quail. And then a, another dimension is the leaves. The leaves provide um, food for the larva of uh, moths and butterflies and other insects. A few listed on Calscape are the alfalfa looper moth, uh, the wavy line emerald moth. All right, yeah, so I, I'll just conclude this chapter by saying white sage has a lot of really important ecological relationships and you know, as, as I think many people know on this call and, and what really resonates about native plants is that you can't just see native plants in isolation. They're so, so critically important to um, our ecosystems and to supporting this web of life and white sage is no different. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about this uncomfortable viral trend and just how international it's become. So we explore this question in the documentary, you know, how did white sage go viral? Um, it's popping up in articles in blogs and newspapers and social media all the time now. And we think it's really reached this international celebrity status in kind of a horrifying way, um, really through social media um, and through mainstream media. Um, and the number of shows, TV shows, movies that you see now, I mean, I feel like every other week I watch, you know, a show on Netflix or on HBO um, and I'm, you know, hoping to relax down on the couch after a long day of native plant conservation and advocacy. <laughs> and I find one of these shows using someone using a smudge stick, a character referencing smudging. And it's like, oh, dear God, this has really just gotten so out of control. Um, it's really become a, a viral trend that's so part of our mainstream culture now that it's, you know, seen across all of these platforms. And so this has real consequences. This is a really big part of 
um, the problem that we're seeing is this, is this cultural appropriation. And so what that cultural appropriation does when you have so many people internationally that want to use this, um, who are non-native people that, uh, who are not native to Southern California or Baja California, people that see this on HBO and Netflix, uh, see it at their yoga studios, see it on social media, um, they want it. They want, they want that uh, trend. They want to be part of that. It, it draws people in. And so the cultural appropriation fuels this marketplace. Um, and when Rose and Deb were really investigating this, um, and they showed this to me for the first time, and they started doing presentations at California Botanic Garden and other places, it was, it was really mortifying to see how far, you know, we're not just talking about a smoke shop here, a yoga studio there, you know, we're talking about a vast online and brick and mortar marketplace for White Sage. You know, and here, here's where we say, you know, White Sage, it's sold everywhere. It's on Amazon, it's on Walmart, it's on Alibaba, it's on Etsy. Um, and the reality is, is that with very few commercial growers of this plant, uh, the vast majority of these products, you know, are wild harvested. Um, and if they're, you know, one thing that you'll often find in this world is that uh, in the White Sage commodity, you know, commodity marketplace, uh, people will say, oh, ethically gathered or sustainably harvested from the wild. And, you know, I think we're, you know, most of us know it's like there's not an ethical or sustainable way to wild harvest, especially in the, the, the age we're living in, where we're seeing such, you know, crazy species collapse and biodiversity challenges. Um, you know, really the route here is to counteract uh, the commercialization of white sages to grow it. Um, and here's just some, some samples that, that Deborah and Rose found. Just it's, It truly is international. My husband's uh, a part Japanese and uh, is, speaks the language and looked up on you know, Japanese Google, basically white sage. And we just found this litany of videos and content in Japan about white sage. It's really become you know, a, a very popular product. And that same is true in Germany, it's in other European countries, uh, it's become quite the international celebrity. Uh, and here's just some online marketplaces. You know, you can do it right now. You know, you could open up a tab and go to Amazon, go to go to Etsy, and type in White Sage, and you'll just be confronted with this almost endless supply. And on Etsy, we one time I think found a vendor who basically said unlimited supply, and I think just basically exposed themselves. Said, "I live right next to the Y. You know, the basically what what we think is Etiwanda Preserve, and is like." you know, unlimited supply, you just place your order and I'm gonna go and get you this magic sage growing in this wild location. You know, I'm based in Rancho Cucamonga. So, you know, what you'll find in this is that the idea of wild, wild sourced or wild crafted is still a huge um, marketing draw in our, uh, in our, you know, in our culture. Uh, when people say this is gathered from the wild mountains of California, that's that is sexy to so many consumers, um, and we're we're really trying to 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 address that and confront that and say you know no it's not you know the reality is is that when things are wild harvested and wild crafted with with white sage, um, it's it's decimating local ecosystems. It's also decimating indigenous people's connections to this to this plant. Here's an example of that. You know, so here you can see. Um, this post on an online marketplace, you know, in the, about the second or third line, it says, you know, uh, these sticks were wild crafted in the coastal mountains of San Diego count, County, California. Um, it makes some just kind of very peripheral nod to Native American uses without any real investigation into what that means or what communities are there. Um, and again, to the unknowing consumer, that's really romantic, right? It's wild crafted in the coastal mountains of San Diego County. That sounds so. That sounds so wonderful, and, and it, it does to thousands, thousands of people that buy this stuff. Um, so, what you have when you have this international demand, uh, when you have this, you know, marketplace, like how does that marketplace get sustained when there's virtually no uh, commercial growers? Well, it's the poaching, and Rose and and, and Deborah have done a lot of work to gather uh, these forms of evidence and these these uh, doc this documentation. Um, a lot of these photos are coming from Ron Goodman, who's a uh, park ranger at the Etiwanda Preserve. I think probably many of you are familiar with that. It's over in kind of the uh, eastern edge of the San Gabriel Mountains. And it was a, a mitigation 
measure uh, for the 210 freeway um, acreage set aside with this beautiful, you know, old growth stand of, of white sage plants. Um, and even though it's protected, even though it has park rangers, uh, there is constant uh, poaching going on. You heard Ron in the trailer say, you know, over the last three to five years, he estimates that 15 uh, to 20,000 pounds of white sage have been taken out of uh, the North Etiwanda Preserve. Um, and you're looking at a photo taken by Ron. This is his truck with duffel bags full of sage. And I believe this is somewhere in the range of 900 pounds, don't quote me, but a huge amount, a huge uh, number of uh, white sage. Um, so as I said, there's a black market for this. Busts are constantly being made on both sides of the border. When we were filming uh, Saging the World, uh, we talked with um, an executive director of a park down in uh, Baja and Tecate, uh, Fund Fundacion La Puerta. Um, they have 2,000 acres of white sage habitat that they manage. And uh, the executive director said, sadly, over the last several years, you know, there's, there's no sage left. There's no white sage left. And the, the people that go out to gather it, they, they do not tell their staff to confront them because they don't know if they're armed. Um, and we, we hear these stories time and time again of uh, poaching happening in so many different, so many different places. So I just want to share some of the, the documentation. Um, something that's really important uh, to know in this work is that the people that are being caught are, are by and large uh, people who are undocumented, who are very wrongfully being caught in the, in, in the crossfire. And so at least to our knowledge today, we do, I don't think there's been a kingpin or manager or the person who's basically paying these workers to go pick sage, they have not been caught. The people that are getting caught, fined, and, and sometimes deported are, are undocumented workers that are sent out to these sage fields. You know, I think we've heard with like, you know, a map quest printed out map, a pair of pruning shears and a duffel bag um, and told to go pick it. And Ron says, you know, they're paid 25 cents to a dollar per pound. And we're hearing now that on the black market, a, a, a pound of white sage sells for 60 to $90. So if we're to really address this problem, at least this dimension of it, it's going after the people that are managing this black market. It's not, it's not these undocumented people who are being so unfairly targeted. Um, and so it's just another layer of this, of this really complex issue and, and really um, this issue that's really, really important for us to address. Here's just Ron's statement again. And he has, he has endless photos of, of the bus that I think he's, you know, especially in the spring, he says, when poaching is at its peak, he can get calls, you know, several times a week, you know, at least once a week, he's hearing about a bus going on. He has a network of people that are, are watching and monitoring the park. Um, here's just testimony from people in our film. This is Teresa Romero. Uh, she's the environmental director of the San Inez Band of Chumash Indians. And this really struck me, you know, she's just said directly that like, two years ago, she went out to her ancestral gathering spot for white sage, where her and her family have, you know, taken, they have gathered white sage from this place. They have also taken care of it. They've taken care of it for thousands of generations. It's in the family, so to speak. It's a place where, you know, they have gathered it and tended that white sage in such a way that it's been there for her family for, for very, very, very many years. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at that through the paradigm of a land manager, you know, the work that Teresa's family has done there is um, really positive. Um, but she went there two years ago and somebody had come in and harvested all of it, had come in and taken all of it, um, just take, basically ripped the plants out by the, by the roots. Um, and she says that's such a deep grievance against the tribes where white sage has grown. And she's deeply concerned about the ways people are harvesting it because it's not going to re replenish itself in the wild. And here's Norma Mesa again. Uh, she says uh, the Kumaye, her community, have uh, 11,500 hectares. Um, and so there's many areas of sage. And the other day, she found people pruning it and pruning it all the way down. And the stories that we hear like this in, in, in uh, Northern Baja, California, it's that same story of Fundacion La Puerta, where uh, community members are very nervous or, or, or frightened to go and confront these people because they don't know how that conversation is going to go. They don't know if uh, that group of people are armed. They don't know how they're going to respond or react. 
um, and law enforcement in, in Mexico, they're not going to care about, about this particular issue. So what we're saying in, in this campaign and in the documentary, which I hope you all get a chance to see and I'll share some screenings um, with you all, the messages that we're really uh, sharing is to know your source as a consumer, know your source and to boycott wildcrafted sage products. So if you see white sage for sale, um, I've seen it for sale at Whole Foods, at World Market, at my local, you know, walking by crystal shops or yoga studios, you know, to just speak with people that are selling it there um, you can also write to those locations, those branches, and ask them to stop selling sage products that are harvested from the wild. Um, you know, just just to ask, where where did where do you get this from? Where where you know, can you tell me about how it's sourced? Um, two number two, which I you know is is so important and wonderful, is to grow your own white sage and the native plants that are specific to your region. So of course, you all in the San Gabriel Mountains chapter, this is your white sage is you know you are in the heart of white sage world. So it's wonderful to grow white sage and it's such a beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, and so we say, you know, by cultivating these plants, you really support the habitat that you call home. And then the third uh, mission here is to re help people reorient their cultural lens. And so, you know, I think it's, it's, this is summarized really beautifully by Craig Torres in the film, who's Tongva. He says, you know, it's really important to see plants as relationships and not as resources. You know, when we start to see ourselves in relationship with plants, uh, paradigms can shift. We can really start to root into the places that we call home. Um, and I think native plants are just such a profound and powerful way to do that. They allow us to take care of the land that we live on, to take care of the, all of those organisms I just showed you earlier on. You know, when you plant white sage, you're supporting um, all of those organisms. And that, what, what, how powerful is that? You know, that's such a powerful thing uh, in our time, I think. Um, so you're invited. We have some upcoming screenings I wanted to share. Um, I know this is a little bit of a drive, but it's really fun. Um, up in Idlewild, uh, we will be part of the Native American Arts Festival. This is going to be free to the public. It's on Thursday, June 23rd at the Rustic Theater. And we have information about that on our website down below. Um, also, uh, the Los Angeles Natural History Museum. I think it's, uh, uh, it's their first Fridays. Um, they have this wonderful summer event with uh, music and food trucks and just a lot of fun. Well, on the July 1st, Friday, they're going to screen our film, Saging the World. And so um, that'd be a wonderful event to, to go see the film at. And the other thing I'll bring up is that we, we are crossing fingers. I think we're going to be in um, a few upcoming film festivals. And some of the film festivals have virtual access. So... Um, there will be what, you know, we're also hoping to do a virtual screening with CNPS again, hopefully in July, just to give everyone the opportunity to watch the film. But um, in any case, there will be lots of opportunities and the best way to stay updated about where you can see the documentary is at our website, um, cnps.org slash saging the world. And there it is again, saging the world, cnps.org. Okay. Well, that is my presentation, but I'm really happy to stay on and uh, answer questions. And I don't know if uh, Rose and Deborah are here, but I also, um, if they are, they can they can jump in too. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Unsurprisingly, we have a ton of questions for you. Uh, Alyssa, you raised your hand. Do you want to start? Sure. I was just wondering, I know that another issue with the places selling white sage is that the, it will usually be mislabeled. And so it will say that it's, it's, you know, ethically harvested or whatever grown and they're actually lying on the packaging. Do you have anything, any suggestions or anything to say about that? Yeah. I, I mean, I've just, just that I, it makes me furious and <laughs> I, I share that experience, just um, people saying it's ethically gathered or sustainably harvested from the wild. And I think that's just such an oxymoron to say it's sustainably harvested from the wild. Um, I think it's just, it's, you know, white sage is the emblem of this story and it's so important because it has such a, an important cultural tie to so many indigenous communities in our region in California. Um, it is, there are so many other plants that are going through the same poaching and same kind of commercialization. So if you go to your local grocery store or co-op, you'll often see um, there's several brands that are popping up that are, you know, soaps and um, bath and beauty products and incense and things like that that'll, you know, be from various, you know, Copal or um, 
just the other day I saw, I, I grew up in Texas and there was an alcohol called Sotol. It's like a tequila type kind of uh, um, beverage. And they're just explicitly saying, oh, we go gather these Sotols in Big Bend, you know, free for the taking. So I think it's just important to, you know, to write um, those retailers if you find them, if you find people selling that and using that labeling to just put pressure them and push on them. Um, and with White Sage, I think we're really hoping to do that. You know, we're going to, uh, we're talking right now about starting a pledge uh, for retailers as well as for consumers to sign on to a very public pledge saying that, you know, they will not sell wildcrafted White Sage products. So I hope, I hope this is the start of addressing that. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, it's so, so complicated and frustrating to see. Um, we've got a couple questions that tie into that really nicely. Um, William H., um, would you want to ask your question out loud? Okay. Um, so what William um, was asking was, uh, since it seems like it's a lot of core members of our chapter here tonight, <laughs> um, do you have any uh, thoughts about what we as chapter can do to get the message out and help? Sure. Yeah. So I think I think we will, you know, definitely be reaching out when we develop this pledge. San Gabriel Mountains is you're again you're right in the heartland of White Sage. So if uh, you know, I think we'll be able to have some conversations about. You know, once we have that website up and once we have a template letter made, we're also hoping to develop some kind of template communication that people can send to, you know, a store manager or to a e, you know, e-retailer. Once we have those resources, we'll share them with your chapter. Um, the other thing is like at your plant sales, which I know you already do, you know, really sell White Sage and use that as a um, moment to talk to people about the issue. Uh, I think we're, we're really experiencing, we, we at CNPS, we have the several different campaigns working with nurseries that are selling native plants. And we just hear anecdotally that uh, White Sage is selling really well right now. Um, so people I think are getting tuned into this issue. So to give people that ability to purchase it and grow it themselves is really great too. Okay, and then um, Kathy, uh, you had a question that I think we're all wondering. Um, yeah, I wanted to know if it would really be acted upon. Um, I, I saw somebody carrying a duffel out of a Henniger flat trail one time when I was headed in mm -hmm. and, you know, I didn't see what was in the duffel, but I could sure smell it. And I don't know how white sage, black sage, you know, some very fragrant combination. And I, I was like, what do I do? Is this illegal? Um, you know, I, at the time I wasn't really sure. And I thought, well, um, if I hadn't been a, with a friend of mine, I probably would have like tried to follow him back to a car and get a license number or something. But, um, you know, if, if I did that, you know, of course I would try to be, you know, not obvious about it, but is, is a sheriff going to act on it? You know, what are, what are our chances of somebody actually taking it seriously? And, and is, and is the sheriff the right person to, um, report it to, or is there somebody else? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's such, such a traumatic experience. But yeah, I just I would just be really safe in that, in that type of encounter. Yeah, I'm not going to confront anybody. But still, uh, I, is it is it the Altadena sheriff? Is it? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it, it brings to mind. I mean, I, I'm it is fortunate, I guess, to hear that with the Etiwanda Preserve that there has has been a lot of um, active, you know, the police have been supportive. I think the Ranch Cucamonga Sheriff's Office have been supportive and are are backing up that uh, with law enforcement. Um, and so, you know, I think what's really important to know is like wherever you experience that to, to find out the, the land manager for that particular park or area and communicate that with them, that's a really important thing to do. And they will, they will have agency and ability to contact the right law enforcement to get them involved. Um, what, what is, uh, you know, it, it feels, feels good. I think we're hearing some buzz about California Fish and Wildlife getting more invested in this and starting to take the white sage poaching more seriously. Um, and so we're just hearing buzz about that at Etiwanda. But I think the more, if you see that, find whoever the local land manager is for that park or place that you are at, and they will be able to figure out the right conduit for, for law enforcement. Thank you. Um, David, just because it's such a large part of our territory and where a lot of us go hiking. Um, is there, 
do you happen to know who that might be um, in the national forest? I don't, I don't, but I think that information could be found, you know, on the, like the San Gabriel, uh, the national forest website. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Sally had a, a question about uh, the market for this. Sally, do you want to ask? I think she signed off. Oh no, she's still here. Um, the question she was asking was, uh, do we have any idea who the market is for Sage at 60 to $90 a pound? Oh, who the market is? Oh no, I, I think what's been really interesting is like I said, Rose Ramirez and Deborah Small have been um, working on this intensely for, for a number of years now um, and working with journalists. So we actually, with them at the helm and Kind of working in, in coordination you know we have articles in atlas obscura um, in the los angeles times um, and we're, we're seeing large outlets interested in, in researching and investigating this issue and so these journalists from really from national and international outlets actually um, have tried to answer that question about where is it going who is actually selling it and we we haven't figured that out yet it's a very complex complicated issue um, but it, yeah, it, it's a really kind of important piece of the puzzle to figure out. But I think our, our feeling is that we really are working on education because we think that the consumers that are ultimately purchasing this are persuadable. Um, we think when we think about who, who is using White Sage, whether you're talking about millennial, you know, predominantly millennial people, people in the new age movement, people in yoga practices, people who are doing peaceful protests like Women's marches and Black Lives Matter. When you see when you see White Sage used in those contexts, um, our feeling is that if we can just tell people about the actual truth behind that Sage bundle that's become so ubiquitous, that these audiences will will be like, "Wow, oh my gosh, we need to stop using that." Um, so that's where we're feeling like education is a really important component. And uh, then another person asked, uh, "What happens to the Sage that is seized? Do we know?" Yeah, that's a really, a really good question. And it's really, um, so Kimberly, Kimberly Morales Johnson, who I talked a little bit about, she often will get a call from Ron when uh, the sage has been confiscated. And whenever Ron can, whenever people like Kimberly can meet up, he'll deliver the confiscated sage to indigenous people in the area. And they will, you know, Kimberly does her best to wrap up as many sage bundles as she can and provide those to uh, people in her community, elders, other indigenous, um, other indigenous communities. The, the really sad part about that is that, you know, when you're, when he drives up and he has like 600 pounds of white sage, you know, Kimberly says she can work all night until 2 a.m. and she just scratches the surface of how much sage there is and, and much of it basically molds um, and becomes unusable. So whenever possible, I know that Ron tries to give the, the white, the confiscated sage to, to people like Kimberly. Well, I think that's all the questions that came through. Um, unless anyone else wants to raise their hand or just unmute themselves to ask something. Yeah, I have a question. <clears throat> this is Gabi. Um, you, you mentioned that um, you can tell where the sage grows by going on iNaturalist. And um, I'm wondering if maybe they should hide the locations so the poachers wouldn't know where to go. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. Yeah, it's it's part of the problem where white sage is not recognized as a rare and endangered plant, um, but the rate that it's being poached, it kind of inhabits this, this kind of, you know, worse for wear designation where it's not rare and endangered, so it doesn't have the same kind of scrutiny or, or uh, you know, protection put over it and how that translates to iNaturalist, like iNaturalist will obscure the location of rare species, but since white sage isn't, it won't obscure it. So I think that's, that's an amazing thought, Gabby, just, I think we can reach out to iNaturalist and ask, what would be the ability to obscure the data points for a plant? Yeah, they do it for rare plants, but um, right. I don't, 
I don't know if they would do it for that purpose. It's a great idea, yeah. Okay, I had a question and I'm not muted. Um, I asked if you could go up and cut cuttings and Orchid said, yes, you can. So if they get the, the bags of uh, white sage that they've confiscated fast enough, we, we might be able to, you know, we could probably chip in and, and, and replant them or, or, you know, plant them in nursery pots to get back into the, you know, just so the place isn't so decimated. It's possible. I, I, from what the, the poached sage that I've seen has been so mutilated. Okay. And it's really just the leaves. Like they'll just strip all the, the leaves off of the. Okay. Stem. Okay. Because you said they were pulling it out by the roots. And that would indicate that, you know, if you got the roots in water fast enough, you could probably make cuttings from that and, and repot them. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. I wouldn't mind just reaching out to Ron and just asking, like, what, you know, have you ever seen it gathered in a way where it could be, where you could do cuttings from it? Well, I mean, you know, that's something that we could do as volunteers when they got a big load that was fresh, we could, you know, pot it up. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting thought. And, you know, bring it home, nurture it, and take it back to wherever it goes. We would have to be worried about cleanliness and stuff. So maybe that's something that we could coordinate with, like, Haha ha Manga Nursery or something like that. That's a good idea. Yeah. Because it's a shame that, you know, that it would go to waste and it has been stolen. Um, the whole thing is sad. Yeah, I imagine it's evidence and it just ends up getting photographed and documented yeah. and destroyed, but it could take them a while to do that processing. But I, I, I assume it has to be fairly soft to make a bundle because I've, I've you know, I have sa white sage and when I cut it off, well, when it gets broken off and I pick it up, it's no longer soft enough. It's just crinkly. So, I mean, I don't know how long it's been broken off or who broke it off, but probably it's just animals. Okay, well, thank you, BJ, for starting that conversation for us. Um, I wanted to call on Wendy if she is interested in speaking. She had some interesting comments in the chat as well. Wendy, would you? like to speak up about what you were? Oh, about the lady in that confronted me? <laughs> yeah. I, my, I have a nursery, a little nursery at home called Sundog Nursery. And I was up in Wrightwood at a plant cell. I think Orchid came by and said hi. Uh, but a, a lady from the US Forest Service, retired, came up and accused me of selling something that was illegal to sell. I had gotten my plants from El Nativo Nursery in Irwindale. Oh I God. said, no, these are these are nursery grown plants. And she goes, that's just illegal. You can't even possess white sage. I said, I know you can't. It's a big thing right now. I'm, I'm aware of that. I said, but these are nursery grown container plants and it's okay. This is what will help combat people pulling it from the wild is if we can get it established in gardens. And she just, she really laid into me. Then she went to my friend next door and got mad at her for I'm selling milkweed. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, that just sounds. <laughs> I thought this is bizarre. Am I doing something wrong? <laughs> no, that's just yeah. bizarre. Yeah. I, it was weird. I, I, I've had experiences with the same, like the, the U.S. Forest Service or California Fish and Wildlife staff sometimes like don't, don't recognize horticulture as a, like a thing. <laughs> like the idea yeah. of growing native plants. How, how do you do that? Uh, so I, for some reason that doesn't surprise me yeah she was really mad she goes i noticed you were selling white sage you know that's illegal and i was like what since when <laughs> oh anyways that was my story <laughs> thanks wendy um and i think that was everything that i saw as questions is there anybody else who had any questions or comments that you wanted to bring out out loud? No, well, thank you, David. It was a great presentation. Uh, 
sounded like a lot of people here was really interested in helping out. Is it anything you can say, a contact, or should we just run it by the chapter ourselves? Or you yeah, you could definitely you, you can definitely contact me. I think the the best thing just to stay abreast of all of the uh, work that we're doing is using that website. I'll, I'll paste it in the chat. Um, and then if there are, you know, if people have any comments or want to reach out to me, um, I'm going to paste my email in the chat. Um, please feel free to, for, to reach out. I was, <clears throat> I was wondering, do you know, I live in, I'm from the San Gabriel Mountains, but I live in Oakland, so I'm in Northern California. So going, attending the screenings is probably unlikely in my case. Do you know if there's any word of them being screened up in Northern California? Yeah, yeah. So we're exploring one at the Sonoma State University. Um, I, I don't have too many details about that right now, but we're exploring it. Um, yeah. And then we were hopefully going to be in a film festival pretty soon. It would be like like in, in mid to late June, that would be, um, you can ex access it virtually. Like the film festival is digital. So you could just log in and watch it. Oh, I, cool. think like, I think for like $10. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we, we have to feel like we can do something and take action. Otherwise, it's just horribly depressing. But I have white sage in my garden. I had one that was kind of ended up in the shade when the plants grew. And so I got another one. So I think every garden, every garden needs a white sage. Yes. <laughs> That's great. Also, I'm noticing in the chat that people are saying that they like the idea of a postcard, a, some kind of postcard template to send out to people like retailers. Do you know if that is something that CNPS would have the, I don't know, the means to do? Or yeah, have, something like that. Uh -huh. yeah that's, what, that's what we want to kind of work on in the next kind of iteration of this work. Um, so we want to create, like I was talking about that pledge idea, but we also want to create some type of template letter that people can use, you know, adapt for communicating with uh, retailers or store managers or Etsy or, you know, what have you, but just give some kind of templated letter that points to resources, points to our website, talks about why, you know, why selling wildcrafted sages is, is, you know, um, not the right thing to do. <laughs> a, temp a template PDF that we could print on cardstock or paper um, would be the most valuable. So, so, so David, um, what I, what would be easiest for me to have would be not only a template letter, but a pre-printed postcard that shows like the poached, you know, like maybe two pictures, the, the sage in the back of a truck and the poached, you know, a decimated area, like the guys with the um, clippers and the trash bags, because for a lot of people, they might never read that letter, but if they see that, and we say no white sage here, you know, um, I think that would be very uh, easier to easier to use. And also if you can, for our social media, give us those images so that we can put them out, you know, and people can, you know, Twitter on Whole Foods or whomever is doing that, or, you know, TikTok or wherever people are doing the, the current social media, um, because those kind of images are very compelling. If people can see it, it's easier for them to counteract all the other images of how great it is. Yeah, that's a great idea. I think what we're gonna probably try to do is create a toolkit that has like postcard, the letter, images with poaching, and just share that out with all of our chapters um, so that you can pick and choose and use and adapt. And But I, I like the idea of giving you all something ready to go, ready made, you can just print out and, and use and also things that you can change and modify. Can you can you compare this to what happened with the Dudleya? And is, is that some kind of a success story that you we can we can follow like the path, like how that worked? Yeah, that's a really great, great point. Um, so with Dudleya, for anyone that doesn't know, CMPS was able to sponsor and lead a bill through uh, the California legislature, um, successfully passed. It's the first bill to address plant poaching, and it established uh, criminal penalties for poaching Dudleya, which are native succulents that grow mostly on the coast, but also into the interior. Um, so 
we definitely looked at that as a blueprint for the White Sage work. White Sage, because it is um, so critically important to indigenous communities in Southern California, Northern Baja, it that presents a lot of um, you know considerations. Um, and so we have to really respect that connection and amplify and uplift that connection. Also, White Sage is so international. You know, Dudleya is international too, but there are very particular markets for Dudleya. There's very particular consumers that want a Dudleya growing in their windowsill or in their succulent collection. Um, it seems like everyone wants a bundle of White Sage and it's a lot cheaper to afford or pick up. So, um, you know, with, with White Sage in particular, I think it is going to be a lot more public education whereas Dudley are really leaned into legislation. And we have been exploring legislation for White Sage, but again, in, in consideration and in acknowledgement of indigenous people and their connection to the land and not wanting to establish penalties that would infringe on people's rights to gather in their ancestral gathering grounds. You know, we're looking at other options, special protections, things like that. Um, but that's, that's how I would kind of summarize where we're at with uh, the White Sage campaign in relationship to the Dudley work. This might be a little, um, not left field, but um, if you were to do that, I am, I'm an artist, I would be happy to contribute some illustrations for the sake of like the postcards or anything like that. Oh, that'd be awesome. That'd be so yeah. good. Yeah. 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 So, if you don't mind emailing me or if you chat your email, I can email you too, but okay. I would love to connect. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Kathy, um, that sounds good. I'll email you and then I'll, I'll make sure that you have my contact and we can follow up. That sounds great. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sounds like a lot of good ideas. Well, is there anything else, Orchid? Um, this was, this has been an amazing presentation and I knew about the subject, but I just didn't realize how, how crazy it had gotten. Um, although when the Secretary of State suggested that they were staging their office after the prior Secretary of State, I knew that we had jumped the shark really. Um, and I, I'm not on the social machine, so I would have said something then, but I just didn't know how. So this is, this is a great tool for that. And thank you so much, David, for speaking with us. And did you want to say anything? Um, yeah, I know your email is in the chat or you know people can always email our uh, cmpssgm.org. There's an email on our website for that. And we'll try and put something on our conservation page as well. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. We'll try and have you for Riverside too. <laughs> okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Such a great talk. Thank you, everyone, David. for signing in. That was really great.